The place looked like something out of Amityville, all paint-chipped walls, dusty windows, and menacing shadows cast by moonlight. I walked through a gate up a flight of creaking steps and knocked on the door. When it swung open, a woman in her thirties with woolly eyebrows and oversized white teeth welcomed me inside. She asked me to take off my shoes, then led me to a cavernous living room, its ceiling painted sky blue with clouds. I took a seat beside a window that rattled in the breeze and watched through jaundiced streetlight as others walked in. A guy with prisoner eyes, a stern-faced man with Jerry Lewis bangs, a blonde woman with a bindi on her forehead. Through the rustle of shuffling feet and whispered hellos, I removed my belt, loosened the top button of my jeans, and settled in. I'd come here on the recommendation of my doctor, who told me a breathing class could help. It could help strengthen my failing lungs, calm my frazzled mind, and maybe give me perspective. For the past few months, I'd been going through a rough patch. My job was stressing me out, and my century-old house was falling apart. I'd just recovered from pneumonia, which I'd had the year before and the year before that. I was spending most of my time at home wheezing, working, and eating three meals a day out of the same bowl while hunched over a week-old newspaper on the couch. I was in a rut, physically, mentally, and otherwise. After a few months of living this way, I took my doctor's advice and signed up for an introductory course in breathing. At 7 p.m., the bushy-browed woman locked the door, sat in the middle of the group, inserted a cassette tape into a boombox, and pressed play. She told us to close our eyes. Through hissing static, the voice of a man with an Indian accent flowed from the speakers. It was squeaky and lilting, as if it had been taken from a cartoon. The voice instructed us to inhale slowly through our noses, then exhale slowly, to focus on our breath. We repeated this process for a few minutes. I reached over to a pile of blankets and wrapped one around my legs to keep me warm beneath the drafty window. I kept breathing, but nothing happened. No calmness swept over me, no tension released from my tight muscles. Nothing. Ten, maybe twenty minutes passed. I started getting a little annoyed that I'd chosen to spend my evening inhaling dusty air in an old Victorian. I opened my eyes and looked around. Everyone had the same somber look. Prisoner eyes appeared to be sleeping. Jerry Lewis looked like he was relieving himself. Bindi sat frozen with a Cheshire cat smile on her face. I thought about getting up and leaving, but I didn't want to be rude. The session was free. The instructor wasn't paid to be here. I needed to respect her charity. So I closed my eyes again, wrapped the blanket a little tighter, and kept breathing. Something happened. I wasn't conscious of any transformation taking place. I never felt myself relax or the swarm of nagging thoughts leave my head. But it was as if I had been taken and deposited somewhere else. Time passed in an instant. The tape came to an end and I reopened my eyes. There was something wet on my head. I lifted my hand to wipe it off and noticed my hair was sopping. Then I felt the sting of sweat in my eyes and tasted salt. I looked down at my torso and noticed blotches on my sweater and jeans. The temperature in the room was about 68 degrees, much cooler beneath that drafty window. Everyone had been covered in jackets and hoodies to keep warm, but I had somehow sweated through my clothes as if I'd just run a marathon. The instructor approached and asked if I was okay, if I'd been sick or had a fever. I told her I felt perfectly fine. Then she said something about the body's heat, how inhaled breath provides us with new energy and exhaled breath releases old. I tried to take it all in but was having trouble focusing. I was preoccupied with how I was going to ride my bike home three miles from the Haight-Ashbury in sweat-soaked clothes. The next day, I felt even better. As advertised, there was a feeling of calm and quiet I hadn't experienced in a long time. I slept well. The little things in life didn't bother me as much. The tension was gone from my shoulders and neck. This lasted a few days before the feeling faded out. But what exactly happened? How did sitting cross-legged in a funky house and breathing for an hour trigger such a profound reaction? I returned to the class the next week. Same experience, fewer waterworks. I didn't mention any of this to my family or friends, but I wanted to understand the experience, and I spent the next several years trying to figure it out. Over that span of time, I fixed up my house, got out of my funk, and got a lead on what might answer some of my questions about breathing. I went to Greece to write a story about freediving, the ancient practice of plunging hundreds of feet below the water's surface on a single breath. B. 
Between dives, I interviewed dozens of experts hoping to gain some perspective on what they did and why. I wanted to know how these unassuming people, these software engineers, executives, biologists, and physicians had trained their bodies to go without air for minutes at a time, diving to depths far below what scientists thought possible. When most people go underwater, they bail out at 10 feet, ears screaming. These free divers told me they'd been most people. Their transformation was a matter of training. They'd coax their lungs to work harder, to tap the pulmonary capabilities that the rest of us ignore. They insisted they weren't special. Anyone in reasonable health willing to put in the hours could dive to 100, 200, even 300 feet. It didn't matter how old you were, how much you weighed, or where you came from. To free dive, they said, all anyone had to do was master the art of breathing. To them, breathing wasn't an unconscious act. It wasn't just something they did. It was a force, a medicine, and a mechanism through which they could gain a kind of superhuman power. There are as many ways to breathe as there are foods to eat, said one female instructor who had held her breath for more than eight minutes and once dived to 300 feet. And each way we breathe will affect our bodies in different ways. Another diver told me that some methods of breathing will nourish our brains, while others will kill neurons. Some will make us healthy, while others will hasten our death. They told me crazy stories about how they'd breathed in ways that expanded their lungs by 30% or more. They told me about an Indian doctor who lost several pounds simply by changing the way he inhaled, and another man who had been injected with E. coli, then breathed in ways to stimulate his immune system and destroy the toxins within minutes. They told me about women who put their cancers into remission and monks who could melt circles in the snow around their bare bodies. It all sounded nuts. During my off hours from doing underwater research, usually late at night, I read through reams of literature on the subject. Surely someone had studied the effects of conscious breathing on landlubbers. Surely someone had corroborated the freedivers' fantastic stories of weight loss, health, and longevity. I found a library's worth of material. The problem was, most sources were thousands of years old.